pleasure this evening to welcome Susie Stalbach. Um, I've had the distinct pleasure of visiting Susie at her uh, pottery studio and amazing garden. And I can attest to the fact that it is just amazing and she does know what she's talking about. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading her book and the detail that she has describing her beautiful gardens. So I don't want to take the spotlight from Susie, but um, she's here this evening and she's going to present to us on um, her new book, Garden Miscellany. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank, thank you, Margaret. Susie. And I do have to say this is one of the most beautiful libraries. I like to come out and just look at it. <coughs> we didn't even notice the round windows. We've been, out, we've been out here many times and tonight, I guess not at night when it was all this, like all oh, those little round windows up there on the third floor. How nice. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how the book came to be, and then how I did it, and then a little bit about what's, what's in the book. Um, so how the book came to be is I had um, spent a, a lot of time uh, thinking about and then work, thinking about sunken gardens and working on a book about sunken gardens. I found them you know, very fascinating and I uh, was very excited about it. And uh, my agent was very excited about it. He's like, you know, finally you're going to do a book that's going to make some money for both of us. Just keep working at it. And um, so I did. Um, however, nobody wanted to buy it. You know, he couldn't find a publisher who was interested in it. They, um, they thought it was, you know, too narrow. Nobody cares about something gardens. And um, millennials certainly won't want to buy the book. Not that I have anything against millennials, because I don't. But, um, you know, people who are that age usually have kids with swings and slides and basketballs and they aren't thinking about you know their gardens in that in that way um, but there was one um, editor at Timber Press and Timber uh, is a press that does a lot of gardening books who did like it but wasn't allowed to um, buy it or publish it but he said to me that he would had an idea um, for a while about something he was calling anatomy of a garden and um, you know, I said, would you be interested in, in doing that, taking that on? So I asked him if I could have history in it, because I'm very, you know, the sunken garden book was all garden history, and I'm interested in, in history. And, and he said, yes, you could have history in it, and you could even have a chapter on sunken gardens if you want. So um, that sounded good to me. Um, but then uh, he said, well, OK, now you have to write a proposal for it. You know, I, I could just like sign a contract and lock myself in my room and happily work on it, I had to do a, a proposal, which meant thinking about, well, what what is this? And um, so if we think about like the elements of the garden, what are all the things in the garden that, that make it up? Um, and, uh, you know, so think about things like <coughs> arbors or um, arches, paths, gates, um, potting sheds, water features. And um, so I made a big list, and that became um, the table of contents. So what, what I was thinking about and what it was becoming was a garden book that was not horticultural. So this is like all the things that make a garden except the plants. You know, I mean, there is something about plants in there like hedges, but it's not what, you know, what plant goes with what or what, what uh, um, you know, what repels insects and what attracts insects and those kinds of things. It's going to be all the things that organize the space and tell the story of the garden or move you through the garden. <coughs> um, and, um, and Tom, my editor, wanted it uh, organized alphabetically. That seemed okay. Well, then he wanted me to write it alphabetically, you know. And I've spent many years shelving books alphabetically in the bookstore, but it, that was like, you know, too much. Like, no, I, I can't do that because, of course, Things, you know, things lead to each other, like writing about um, a bird bath. Well, it's like, do I put it in the chapter about birds? Do I put it in the water features? So, well, water is W and birds are B. And so, you know, my mind was not working alphabetically. It was more like what the, what the materials are. Um, I have um, a, a kind of a big library at myself at home of gardening books, so I had that at my disposal to, um, you know, to do research and refresh myself on, on some of these things. And of course, I had to take them all off the shelves and pile them up all around me, all over the house, um, which didn't bother anybody at all, did it, Joe? Um, but, no. <laughs> um, but then 
then of course I had to um, I had to buy more books too, of course. And um, I discovered a couple things. One is that at the beginning of the 20th century, there were a lot of garden books that were published that were written by women, often very opinionated women, and um, and very good good gardeners with ideas of how things should should be organized. And a lot of these books are still available, and they're you know they used good paper then, and the bindings were sewn, and the covers were cloth, and they're like three dollars. So I had to you know got those, and those those are fun. What I wanted to do you know it's today you know we have to do internet research too, um, and that which you know everybody does now. And I did find some things that were like no this this is not. This is not true at all. There was, um, again, working on birds and bird baths, I found three different citations that um, the Pullum family, who were great potters in uh, uh, mid-19th century England, and who also uh, developed this uh, artificial stone that um, people could use to make grottos and stuff. Well, they were, they were credited with um, you know, creating the first bird baths. Well, we know that's not true, because if you look at any, you know, frescoes from ancient Rome, there's like bird baths and birds and, and um, you know, and the Egyptians had bowls and bird baths. So, you know, I had to be, I had to be careful. But um, there's also like really fun things like um, there are now whole uh, databases of old gardening magazines from, you know, like the, the 19th century and some of the early 20th century at a time when Gardening magazines weren't like wonderful photographs, be like engravings, and there's a lot of text. You know, and today our, our magazines have, you know, very brief text that focuses on the visual. And this, you know, I'm I'm a junkie for them. I subscribe to every one there is. Um, but it was fun to read these like long, you know, well-researched pieces um, that um, you know we can't get published today. So that so that was fun. Unfortunately. Um, Timber, even though they're a nice press, did not give me like a big pot of money to go out and visit and try, you know, <laughs> fly around the world and visit gardens and look at all these things. So I, I couldn't do that. Um, but I did do, a, you know, a little bit of uh, traveling around or looking around. And of course, you know, like anyone who's a gardener, I always look at gardens or visit gardens when I can. And I was, I was thinking about, um, you know, mazes. I had gone to a number of corn mazes with my granddaughters when they were younger. You know, there's one out in Thompson that we became one of our favorites at uh, Fort Hills Farm where, um, you know, you get an <coughs> emergency cell phone number to call in case you can't get out. Um, so I knew about mazes, but I didn't really know about labyrinths. There's a, you know, come to find out there's a labyrinth, not actually that far from here on um, Route 169 in Woodstock, Connecticut. and. Um, you know, so I went out and, and walked the labyrinth, um, and I was surprised in such a small space. It actually took me like 15 minutes to, to walk it, and you can't just like race through it. Um, and I'm thinking about that in, in, in labyrinths and doing work on labyrinths and mazes. You know, a labyrinth is universal. There's the entrance and the exit are the same. There's one path that goes around, and um, the classic labyrinths are, you know, the or it's seven, and then it could be added in courses of four. And the same design has appeared, you know, all over the world <coughs> in different time periods. Um, fishermen in Scandinavia um, made them along on the shores. Um, they were popular in the Middle Ages, and um, we have them today. In um, you know, hospitals, have them for places for people to think and breathe and. Um, some churches have them, and and, uh, and today you can put one in your backyard. Can you, can, I, I'm trying to visualize this. Are they like with the corn mazes? You can't see around with the labyrinths. So so so, the labyrinth. I mean, it can have a high hedge, but oh, okay. it, it doesn't matter. But most of them, in the one in Woodstock, mm -hmm. um, it, that's made with stones that etch, that design other oh, things. Okay. But yeah. some of the ancient ones was the, was raised turf. Mm -hmm. um, the fishermen used shells, and you know today you can actually buy landscape cloth that um, has a pre-printed design, so you can make your own in your, you know, backyard. Just fill, you know, fill it in with mulch or grass, and, and put out your stones or whatever it is you want to put out. You know, a maze is a puzzle, and it can have uh, 
multiple entrances and exits. It has dead ends. I mean, it's a trick. Um, to, and, and it was an enter, what they were made as an entertainment, and it's amazing that we think of that often had, the big estates had the big high hedges and you couldn't see over, and that's how it is in the corn mazes. And, and um, there's some sunflower mazes around too. Um, and so that, you know, that got me thinking that, you know, about how many things, how many of these elements have actually appeared in gardens over and over again throughout the world and throughout history, like swings. You know, um, you know, I mean, who doesn't like to swing? I still like to sit and swing and, 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 and swing outside. And there's, um, you know, we know the Aztecs had swings. There's um, um, artifacts of, ceramic artifacts of like a little stylized guy sitting on a swing, just, just like a board like we think of and the, and the ropes and, you know, he just, he just swings. A lot of, the, on um, some of the ancient uh, Greek um, vases, um, there are depictions of people on swings, particularly women or women and children swinging. So, you know, we know they had swings in, in their gardens. And there are a lot of paintings, particularly from uh, the Renaissance and, and later, depicting people <coughs> in gardens with lots of flowers and roses and, you know, women with long flowing hair and their beautiful baby swinging. Um, and that, that became very popular. And then, you know, here in our country, um, in the early 20th century, porch swings became very popular. They were, they were popular before our activities moved to the backyard, when people still, all their activities outside the home that were social were in the front on the, on the porch. And, and from that, uh, we got lawn swings, um, which we still have, and got those. Um, and then from the 1930s, the um, metal gliders, the clamshell gliders, um, came. So it's like, you know, so we've been putting swings, you know, everywhere in, in our, in our, um, in our gardens. And, and, you know, we're thinking about arbors. Um, you know, my, my son has a grape arbor and, um, you know, I would sit under the grape arbor with my son and my granddaughters and grandmothers sat under grape arbors with their sons and their granddaughters in ancient Egypt. But the Egyptians had, um, arbors. And in fact, they, um, their earliest arbors, they took the, they would take the grapevines themselves and train it like into a, into a bower an arbor. And then they realized, well, it would be a lot easier to put some poles, they put a piece across. And um, so they grew them for grapes to eat and grapes to make wine, and, um, and they actually made raisins too, but they also used it um, as a way of arranging their, their garden space and as a place to you know, sit and get shade, because it, it was hot. Was hot there, um, and in fact, the um, hieroglyph for um, wine is like a stylized drawing of the of the grape arbor, and um, you know I learned it appears twice on the um, Rosetta Stone, um, which makes me wonder what actually the Rosetta Stone is talking about. I don't know, but um, you know, so I thought, you know, so you know, just so we see that all these things that seem very particular to our gardens, and we certainly have arbors in our gardens, whether it's something like a grape arbor or a smaller arbor that just directs you through the garden or draws you in, or an arbor that, um, you know, we cover with roses and things, and that's a great place to take a picture of, you know, the bride, you know, or the, you know, someone going to the prom or, or whatever, because it's a nice frame and, it, you know, it's, it, it just looks pretty. I, I thought what I would do, so that's, that's a little bit about how I came about the book and what it's about, and I thought what I would do is just read you a couple little bits um, <coughs> from it, and then um, we'll talk some more. And the, um, you know, I, I included, um, in addition to, you know, things like arbors and, and paths, um, I also included kinds of gardens, because we have the benefit of information about gardens throughout history and travel. So um, today we might have, you know, a, a bigger garden and within it we might have a rock garden, we might have a Japanese garden or something like that. So I included those as elements too, um, even though they're actually kinds of gardens. So the one I'm, I'll read a little bit about um, fairy gardens. Um, so gardeners have been infatuated with miniatures for thousands of years. In China, Taoists created miniature mystical landscapes as early as the first century. By the Tang Dynasty, 
the art of Penjing, creating miniature landscapes and ceramic or bronze dishes, was in full flower. These sophisticated groupings featured tiny trees, mountains, and lakes. Japanese travelers brought some of the dish gardens home where, influenced by Zen, simplicity, the gardens evolved into a single, heavily pruned and trained tree in a shallow ceramic dish, a style that would come to be known as bonsai. Victorians used inherently diminutive alpine plants in their rock gardens to create miniature landscapes, sometimes scale models of actual landscapes. In the late 19th century, Lady Broughton created miniature mountains and valleys and imitations of the mountains and valleys of Savoy at her manor house. Victorians also enjoyed creating miniature worlds and terrariums, which they enhanced with moss, pebbles, and sticks. <clears throat> Meanwhile, fairies, elves, wood sprites, and wee folk occurred in pre-industrial European folklore and superstition for centuries, perhaps millennia. They could be playful, mischievous, or threatening. Parents believed that fairies could steal a baby and take the infant's place, becoming a changeling, a fearful thought that explained children with birth defects or problematic behavior. Naturally occurring fairy rings and circles of mushrooms were evidence of reveling elves or dancing fairies. Unexpected mishaps, and worse, were blamed on fairies. In order to avoid their tricks and pranks, Europeans of the time believed it was provident to create a welcoming space for them with soft leaves for beds and other niceties. In the 1950s, Anne Ashbery promoted miniature gardens as a solution for elderly, handicapped, and landless gardeners. Her book, Miniature Gardens, also intrigued gardeners who suffered from none of these inconveniences. An interest in miniature gardening spread first in the United States and then in the UK. All of these historical threads are found in today's gardens. And then I go on and talk about you know, what's in fairy gardens today. And it's become very popular. A lot of house yeah. museums um, have like fairy garden events or like the Florence Griswold Museum invites artists to create fairy houses and then they put them out in the beautiful gardens there. Um, so it's, you know, as again, it's just like we've just been intrigued with tiny things for thousands of years. Um, more um, prosaically, I'll, I'll uh, go to uh, compost bins. <laughs> <laughs> The first written account of people mixing decaying organic matter for fertilizer appears on clay tablets from King Sargon's reign during the Akkadian Empire in present-day Iraq, around 2300 BCE. It describes manure compost. There is also evidence of early composting in China, cooked bones, manure, and silkworm debris. India, and some experts contend, in situ composting as much as 12,000 years ago in Scotland. Ancient peoples likely, I, I said Scotland, not Ireland, mm -hmm. Margaret, I heard you. <laughs> um, ancient peoples likely noticed that the plants that sprang up where their rotting plant matter and livestock waste were particularly robust. Cleopatra was so taken with the work that worms do in making compost that she protected them, decreeing that any Egyptian who took worms out of the country would be put to death. Hmm. In his old age, the Roman farmer and author, Cato the Elder, wrote a reflective treatise on farming in which he shared his agricultural advice. He counseled his fellow agrarians to make a big compost heap of litter, loop and straw, chaff, beanstalks, husks, and the leaves of elix and oak. George Washington, determined to discover how best to improve his soil, tested compost <coughs> with different ingredients. He had a stercory, or a dung repository, built in his stables at Mount Vernon a precursor to and rather glorified version of compost bins. Beneath was a pit lined with cobblestones. Above was an open-sided post and beam structure with a peaked roof. Near the ridge line, he added perches for birds. So their droppings would be efficiently recaptured for the compost. Hmm. Washington combined quantity of the stable manure with waste plant material from the farm to make his compost. And there's a reconstruction today of this uh, structure at, at Mount Vernon. <coughs> The art of composting was largely forgotten during the West love affair with chemical fertilizers and pesticides. This changed when Jerome Rodale, founder of Rodale Press, read An Agricultural Treatment by Sir Albert Howard. Howard had spent almost 50 years in India, where he made his mission to increase the fertility of the depleted soil. He faced obstacles. 
Dung was burned for fuel, and also was, and so was not an option. <coughs> Chemical fertilizers were too costly. Having read about Chinese composting, he ultimately developed what he called the indoor compost, or indoor is the name of the town, not indoor like inside, after the town where he worked. Howard layered vegetable waste with manure and turned his concoction on a regular schedule. During much of the year, this was done in pits, but during the monsoon season, he composted above ground. Deeply impressed, Rodale became an ardent evangelist for organic farming and composting, and began his own 60-acre organic farm in Pennsylvania. To promote his ideas, he started a magazine, Organic Farming and Gardening, with the tagline, Back to Nature with Agriculture, and sent 12,000 complimentary copies of the first edition to, in 1942 to American farmers all over the country. And um, you know, I'll stop there. It goes on about how they're made and, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, while I was writing the book, um, of course, I was tending my own garden, and it was getting uh, weedy, and and um, terrible things were popping up in it, like thistles and wild garlic, and all the awful things that we have around here that pop up. And, uh, and I wasn't, wasn't dead ending. And, and what was making it even worse is there I am, you know, my, my garden is falling apart. And, um, but each chapter that I was reading, I wanted to add to the garden. It's like, you know, I, you know, I thought, well, I need a fancy compost <coughs> pin where the, pin where the birds like just put their droppings in and you don't have to do any work. Or, you know, I, I, I need, I need a, um, a caravan, a gypsy caravan in, 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 my, in my garden. Or I, I need a water feature. Um, but, uh, but of course, wasn't to be, and um, I kept going. But it, you know, it was a lot, of, a lot of fun to, a lot of fun to write, and a lot of things that um, to learn about and think about. And um, it's kind of a winter book, uh, kind of a book just for um, dreaming and thinking and planning. And um, I hope you think it's fun too. And I will be happy to uh, have a conversation and take questions, no, no comments. But I have a question about uh, Mount Vernon. You mentioned <coughs> Washington's. The way he designed it, can uh -huh. you explain a little bit more in detail what it looked like? So it, you know, it has a pit lined with cobbles with stones. And how how wide was it? Uh, how, you know, I have the dimensions. No I can't idea. think okay. of them off the top of my head, but you know, and then it's like a, a open post and beam structure with with a roof. So and you know how birds are. You know, they they will they will come. They will always and, do. Yeah. Yeah, and so um, he would collect the droppings, but then he added other things to it because he he was interested in figuring out what was what was best. Now was he adding and removing a material during the course of the yeah, season? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. he kept it. He kept it going. Yeah, so he kept speak. it going. Yeah, he was, he was kind of scientific about it. He was into it. Well, normally a good a good compost heap can last centuries if you tend it correctly. Yeah. You probably didn't have to move it, and his descendants probably used the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it got neglected and it fell apart. You know, long after he was gone, but it has been reconstructed and That's you know, re redone again. Very good. Yeah, I just looked it up actually, mountvernon.org, and it doesn't give the dimensions, but it shows you the reconstruction and stuff yeah, like that. It's actually fascinating. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Does it say how long the other one lasted? It doesn't. Okay. No. It did say, I think it was 1787 <coughs> or something like that. It was, okay. 1787 was, it, it was when it was constructed. He, he had a lot of influence, because the other, the other influence he had on, on gardens, um, and, and Jefferson did this too. Is they had lawns, and you know people didn't have lawns, but there was like pictures of pictures of their lawns were circulated, and then, then people started wanting lawns. Although of course we'd have lawnmowers then, so it was a lot of work, but you know it kind of made it um, popular. And I'm sure the, the unlimited wealth that they had oh, yes, made it a right, lot easier. Yes, exactly. Someone trying to do a compost heap on a budget is you right. know, more challenging. Yes. Thoughts or questions? Everybody here a gardener? Yes. Would you like to talk about um, your life as a gardener and how that overlaps with your pottery and how your, you know, like things sort of merge, you know, where the lines blur and, you know, you've made the. Your well, it's all about part. dirt and mud. Right. right. At heart. Right. Um, you know, actually, traditionally, it's not, this is another thing that's, that's been. Um, you know, pretty common throughout history is potters were often farmers, or farmers were often potters because you could you could do one, you know, you could make pots during the winter and fire in the summer, but you were also gardening in the summer. Um, so it, you know, it wasn't necessarily 
flower gardening stuff. So they, you know, in that way, it's just been a, a symbiosis for for a long time. Um, you know, I didn't get into both of them <clears throat> the same way, and um, but uh, but you know, they're both about appearance and how things look, and they're about you know space and shape and and color and, and those kinds did of things. You get involved with first. I got involved with gardening first. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I come from a family that always grew vegetables. You was going to say flower gardening? But, well, I, gardening? I, sometimes I grow a few vegetables. I, mean, I did used to grow more vegetables, but, you know, now it's really about flowers. You know, and, you know, I, we have friends who, who grow vegetables. I have children who grow vegetables. We have farmer's markets, so that's just more room for flowers. I do have a cutting garden where I can cut them. I have a question. When you first started, was it a lot easier to get bees to pollinate your your um, your crops than than it is now? I, I think you know. Actually, I think a number of things are easier. Certainly, there were there were more birds. You know, it was interesting to read how many birds are um, how our how depleted our bird population oh, is yeah. a couple of weeks ago in in, in the, I think it was the Times because you know we have anecdotally noticed it's like we have less birds. Um, one thing that I think is really changed and um, you know, clearly I'm not a young woman so this is a while ago uh, is all the invasives you know and I was I was walking my, my son was clearing the fence around his pasture it's like none of these things that he's battling were here when the early settlers were here or when the Native Americans were here it's like you know it's the, the bittersweet and the rosa multiflora and and you know all these things are like tangling up around his um, fence um, that have to be you know we didn't have them, um, and uh, and certainly in, in my own garden, I have you know some invasives that are a constant, uh, constant problem. One I did to myself. Um, well, probably everyone has a story like that. Is uh, I, you know I planted uh, I planted a wisteria, and I, I mean there's nothing more beautiful than wisteria. Mm -hmm. You know I I hate myself for planting. I can't kill it. It you know it, 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 the roots <laughs> pop up like. Now, we have a house in what was an old hay field, so it's a big, you know, it'll be like hundreds of feet away, and then it's, there's wisteria popping up, mm -hmm. and it's climbing over the, you know, the shrubs and stuff, it's like, oh, and it's invincible. Mm. Well, you know, I can't blame anyone for that but me, because I'm the one who planted it, so. Are you moving back towards that and not planting non-native species? I, I know that there's some gardeners now that are just trying to re hold the um, up in Okafor, Maine, on a long right, margin yeah. away. There's a big move to remove all the invasive species, and it's it's amazing how many invasive species there are. Yeah, and they're trying to put plant, in, you know, natural plantings up there. I, I mean, I try to get rid of. I do try to get rid of the invasive ones. I mean, they bother me, and they're you know they will take over, and uh, you know. Um, I have a very cottagey garden, and things are planted very close together, so it's always on the verge of being out of control, even with the things that belong there. Um, and, um, you know, I, I like it being exuberant. You know, I mean, I, I do sometimes look as like, oh my God, and um, then we have to have a marathon out there. But, you know, but I like that. And, I, no, I'm not, I know I wouldn't be a purist and not grow. I mean, I, honestly, we don't actually know everything was really only here. True. You know, and some things have been here so long. You know, they're like the orange day lilies we see every place. I mean, those are not native to here. They were brought over, or, you know, plantains, which are an annoying weed. Those are, you know, the, the Indians here in New England call them Englishmen's foot because, you know, the early settlers spread them all over the place. Um, I do have, I do have one bad thing. And um, I actually, when I, so I did this when I was younger, I actually dug it up along the Mass Pike when I didn't know it was a bad thing. And that's, but I never let it go to seed, and I don't let it spread, and I have, so I have one purple loose stripe, and it's very beautiful, uh -huh. but I, it, you know, we're not, in, we're not in wetlands, I don't let it go to seed, and I don't let it spread or anything, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of it up at Westville Dam. Well, I know, it's a bad thing. No, it's a bad thing. You can't let it spread. But it is and pretty. It, it is Oh, pretty. It's, it's beautiful, and actually bees like it, um, but no, it's bad, so, so no, I can't let it. I can't let it go to seed. And we have one friend um, 
who, you know, if we know they're coming over, I, you know, I have to cut it down because he can't see that it's here. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, Living on the edge. That's him. Michael. Oh. So, so, he's a serious organic <laughs> farmer. And um, so, no, he can't, he can't know that we have that. Yeah. Thoughts, you mentioned fairy wings earlier. Now, I've heard that expression before, um, representing the edge of um, a mushroom, well, a mycelium in Latin. Right. I don't even yeah. know the English uh, translation. But every year, it would get bigger and bigger. And because of that growth, you could determine the age of it. Now, some of these are a 1,000 years old. I don't understand how they can perpetuate themselves constantly. They thought, that, well, that, that, the explanation was more fairies were coming. <laughs> I, mean, so, I could understand that, yeah. yeah but, but not really, but, you know. In order to um, compete with them, I mean, if you wanted to grow a garden nearby, you'd have to kind of, right. you know, play ball. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you'd lose. But to see the, the rings growing each season and to try and adapt your garden to it, there must be some type of art. Of, I mean, it, it's not science to make that work. It has to be art. Or yeah. Trial and error, maybe. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. But have you ever encountered that in any of your? I don't. Your you know, I have never seen a real one. I've only, you know, I've only seen pictures of them or read about them. I You've never mushroomed in your life? Oh no, we have mushrooms. Yeah, you know, we we have mostly um, morels. We have a lot of morels that pop up. Yeah, those are very early spring. They're right. very good. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. It's tough to eat one moral and stop. Yeah. They're even habit forming for some people. Yeah, we have some critter that eats them too. I don't know if it's the deer or, or rabbits or who who uh, who discovers them pretty quickly because we they'll be like, you know, the head's bit, you know, it's half eaten, yeah. chewed. Yeah. You can see the bite marks. Yeah. In yeah. yeah. the process did you have um, any say in helping to choose the illustrator or is that something that Pub Timber did? I had no say. Um, they uh, they had decided that they wanted illustrations and um, you know at first I was kind of like well that's, I imagined it would be all photographs but they wanted illustrations and I said well I know a lot of illustrators and some of them are um, gardeners and uh, you know in my book selling career we had uh, you know we had a book fair we had a lot of children's illustrators and I, I know some other you know I'm in a couple art groups well they're like you know no stick to your own lane you just write the book we don't really care what what you think about this and they ended up um, and, I'll, and I'll show it to you and, and um, you know I'll talk about how it was done even though you know I don't actually understand the whole process. So it was done, the, the woman's name is Julie Yellow, she's um, from Taiwan, she lives in LA, and her her task um, was to create ten two-page spreads, they're all digital, and she was to do it in layers. So this, this, everything in this picture is in a different layer in the, in the digital art. And then what the designer did would be, you know, to take something out, an element out, and you know, so we take this out of one, and this little thing is out, you know, so she would take different elements out, so each one, that's why it was in so many layers, so she could just take it out and put them throughout the book. Um, so there's no painting or anything that we could like, oh, we'll hang this, this in our house, that's, you know, there's no thing there, it's just all. All in the, in the yeah. oh, that's such a, okay, oh. that's different. I was, I was very happy to see the gold. You know, yes, I've never, I've never had a sparkly lovely. book before. It's a jack, yeah, very sparkly. Yeah. And some of the things, like, um, you know, this person looks like my older granddaughter. In fact, I told her it was her um, because, uh, you know, the older one is, is pretty interested in gardening. So she does a lot of, you know, she does some volunteering in the soup kitchen gardens and that kind of thing. So. Well, I'd like to thank Susie very much for coming this evening and thank for uh, talking about your book and helping us to uh, see all the different facets to coming up with an idea and executing it and having this wonderful um, book that can be used as uh, something forever and ever. I think there's going to be lots of uh, references that people will 
continue to, to look at. And of course it makes an ideal gift for anybody who would want to be in the market for And Susie would be happy, I'm sure, to sign some books. I'll be happy to sign after. them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would like to thank you sincerely for coming. And he takes a lot of pictures of ospreys when you saw the whole osprey story there in the Ashford mm -hmm. Ospreys. <laughs> You know, we were things like, well, maybe we could put an osprey platform up in the garden, but you know, we don't have a pond, so because I don't have a water feature. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so there you go. That'll be a project for next summer. Maybe. Next summer. <laughs> yeah. no. Or next well, spring, I think. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> oh, I w I, you asked about about visiting. Um, you know, not my garden. I have we have open studios actually throughout northeastern Connecticut um, every year, Thanksgiving weekend and the weekend after, and there's 72 artists and. You can just go around and visit, and my studio is open and on it, and my garden is there, but it's brown. And I don't cut everything down. Um, I let it, I leave it, the seeds up for the birds, and then I cut it in the spring. But in, um, so that's going on next weekend and the weekend after. Um, but the second weekend of June, there's a group of us who do an art and garden tour, also in um, Connecticut. And then we, you know, and we have guest artists too, and we do all through that in our gardens with, with our art, and there's, um, you know, and so in addition to my garden, there's, you know, like seven other gardens, and everyone is different. Um, uh, you know, one, one of the gardeners has, um, you know, she has an old colonial house, and it's on a hillside, and it's uh, primarily vegetables, but there's flowers everywhere, and in the middle is um, a greenhouse that her husband made when they um, replaced the windows in the house. So he took all the old windows and built this, like, really cool greenhouse, mm -hmm. you know, and then there's a meditation garden, so there's, um, a lot, of, a lot of crazy cards you see, and that's the second weekend of, and it's free, second weekend of June. So how would one find out about these? Is there a website? Um, look, all of it's on my website, which is littletreepottery.us, um, and then, uh, yeah, we have we have a artist open studio uh, website and an art and garden to our website, but it's all, it's all on, my, on my website. Right. So, okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much, Susie.